This, this is, is TLV1. The Tel Aviv Review. Hello and welcome to the Tel Aviv Review, brought to you by the Van Leeuw Jerusalem Institute, which promotes humanistic, democratic and liberal values in the social discourse in Israel. If you like us, please join our community of supporters by giving to our Patreon campaign. You'll find all about it on our homepage. I'm your host, Gilad Halpern. Every week, my co-host, Dalia Shendlin, and I talk about books and research and other things that have caught our attention. Dalia is away this week, and it is therefore my pleasure, and mine alone, to welcome Rabbi Baroness Julia Neuberger to the show. She's a Reform Rabbi at the West London Synagogue and a member of the House of Laws, as well as a member of several philanthropic organizations, including the Van Leeuw Jerusalem Institute, of which she is chair. She has written several books, including most recently, Antisemitism, What It Is, What It Isn't, Why It Matters. It was published by Orion in 2019, and for the launch of which, she is now in Israel. Rabbi Baroness Julia Neuberger, hello and welcome to the Tel Aviv Review. I'm really delighted to be with you, and please call me Julia, that's a mouthful of a title. <laughs> it is. All right, Julia. So, uh, in the 1990s, you took part in drafting a report on antisemitism titled A Very Light Sleeper, and the copy editor in me admires you for that title. And a quarter of a century on, you've come back to explore the issue of anti-Semitism. What's changed? So when we looked at anti-Semitism, and I ought to explain that when we did that report, it was for uh, a voluntary organization called the Runny Me Trust, which is a, an organization that was set up to look at race relations issues in the UK. And I was a trustee of it. I was on its board. And we thought we should look at anti-Semitism. But I have to confess that we looked at it as a dry run for looking at uh, Islamophobia. And this was a time when Islamophobia wasn't even a common word. So this is back in the 1990s. We weren't sure we could do something sensible on Islamophobia. We knew there was some anti-Semitism around, not a lot, I think I have to say, in the 1990s, uh, and mostly on the right. Um, but we thought that if we could look at it, uh, an anti-Semitism, and do something sensible on it, then actually we might be able to frame something really bigger on Islamophobia, which was already looking like a much bigger issue in the UK. And, well, and, and fast and forward to fast the, forward. Yeah. Okay, so fast forward. So it. So let me just say that in the 1990s, yes, there was anti-Semitism on the right wing. Yes, you were sent ridiculous Christmas cards, which were already starting on Holocaust denial. Holler hoax was just beginning to be a term. Uh, there was all of that stuff, but on the whole, you know what? It was on the right. It was fringe. It wasn't a big deal. And I was a rabbi in South London um, in that, at that time, in a liberal synagogue in South London, and we had somebody painted swastikas on our doors and people were deeply shocked. I mean, this was something that just didn't happen and there was really very little. And I think that's important because when I say there was really very little, there was very little. And now, fast forward... And particularly since Jeremy Corbyn became leader of the Labour Party in the UK, and I grew up in the Labour Party, but since that, it has been apparently acceptable for quite vile anti-Semitic abuse to be freely batted backwards and forwards, particularly on social media. And the lives of many, uh, particularly women, Jewish Labour MPs has been made utterly miserable to the extent that some of them have left and the others have fought back, but with enormous strength and it's been pretty distressing. It just didn't exist in that sort of way. Now, I ought to say that we have seen increasing levels of anti-Semitism in Europe uh, ever since sort of really the year 2000, particularly France. I think people have been very, very concerned about France, but increasing levels in Germany. But I was able to say in 2012, 2013, 2014, that although there were rising instances of pretty unpleasant stuff, a bit on social media, a bit elsewhere, it wasn't extreme. Yes, it was there, but it was... It, it, in fact, actually, that's not fair. It was extreme. It was really seriously unpleasant and vile, but it wasn't very common. 
fast forward and what was a big issue in France was beginning to be a big issue in Britain, not in terms of violence, but yes, in terms of the kinds of abuse. And I think it's really important that we recognise that there has been a step change in the UK, hitherto rather a you know, a tolerant, um, open country, I'm certainly a country where I grew up never encountering anti-Semitism. And we're seeing a great deal of it, largely, but not wholly on social media. So why do you think that time in France, 2000, and this a few years ago, this decade in Britain was a watershed? What was really the cause of that exponential rise? I don't think we know what the cause is. I think we we suggest various things and I suspect that we don't know and probably shouldn't say it's definitely X or Y. I think there's some things you can point to. I think you can point to uh, the years immediately after the Second World War, the knowledge of what happened in the Holocaust, the horror that many people who didn't love Jews particularly felt when they saw the scenes of the liberation of Auschwitz or Bergen-Belsen or whatever. And even if you felt a bit anti-Semitic, in those years you certainly wouldn't have said it. It was completely unacceptable. I mean, it just didn't exist. And I think that's important. So the Holocaust had, had a profound effect on what people felt they could possibly say. That gradually wore off. That's one thing. I suspect that anti-Semitism never really goes away. I think it morphs, it changes its character. So, you know, you can track it from being largely Christian anti-Semitism, stretching through from the very early years of the Christian church into the 19th century and the influence of that continuing. It changes into a sort of racial, uh, it's a nonsense, but racial anti-Semitism, the whole idea, so, so-called fake anthropology, race theory, all of that, you get all of that. And then you get it reappearing as anti-Zionism. And people say, oh, I'm not an anti-Semite, I'm just an anti-Zionist. And there's a test for that, you can test, because there are some people who are anti-Zionist, although I'm not sure I really know what that means. But it is a test for whether somebody is just masquerading as an anti-Zionist when they're really an anti-Semite, or whether they're genuinely deeply opposed to the policies of the state of Israel. And there are plenty of people who are, including people who live in Israel itself. So that's, you know, you're allowed to be opposed to the policies of the state of Israel. But that doesn't mean you can be opposed to the right of the state of Israel to exist. And that's one, and that's of, the, the that's one of that's one of the tests. Mm-hmm. There are several tests. So I would use: Can you say the state of Israel does not have a right to exist? No, you can't. You could say: Had I been alive at the time at which the idea of the state of Israel was being mooted, I would probably have been one of the people who thought that it should not be established. That is legitimate. It's not very nice, and it's a bit impossible. But that would not be totally illegitimate. We know, for instance, there were plenty of British Jews who opposed the creation of the State of Israel. You can see that from the time of the Balfour Declaration. So you could say that. But you cannot say about a country that's over 70 years old, it doesn't have a right to exist. Are you going to say if the Scots eventually get Scottish independence, and who knows what will happen with the Scottish National Party, are you going to say if they get it and it's democratically decided that the Scots are going to go independent, are you going to say Scotland doesn't have a right to exist? How absurd. You can't possibly do that. So that's one test. But the other test is something else. There are two bits of it. One is the tone in which you criticise Israel. If you criticise the policies of the State of Israel in a tone and with a kind of harshness that you would never use for criticising any other country, you're not an anti-Zionist, you're an anti-Semite. And if also you never criticise any other country for far greater human rights abuses than you could possibly accuse Israel of, for instance, China and around a million Uyghurs in concentration and re-education camps, if you don't criticise that, but you criticise Israel, then you've got some pretty major questions to ask yourself. And I would say that that's the other test. Right. But does it always amount to anti-Semitism? I mean, because some people think that perhaps Israel doesn't have the right to exist as a Jewish state, perhaps. Or, I mean, you can always qualify it. No, no, you can always qualify it. So if you say it doesn't have a right to exist as a Jewish state, so that's another one where I think I would take them on. So are you saying that the United Kingdom doesn't have a right to exist because it's got an established church in the Church of England? I think that people can qualify it 
But actually, I think you have to look at it. Is it not okay to have any state that is, has a religious affinity founded on a religion? I mean, what about most Arab states? Are they most of them are Muslim states? Is that not okay? Is well, that and a, if it is, I mean, some it, people say it, that it, the Islamic it, regime in Iran it, should be toppled. Should be, they're should not be toppled. Islamophobic, but they're right? not necessarily saying that the Islamic regime in Iran should be toppled because it's Muslim. They're saying it's because of what it does. So they're being critical of the regime. They're not being critical of the existence of the state, and that's a really important distinction. I could be very, very critical myself of some of Bibi Netanyahu's policies. I really don't like quite a lot of what he has wanted to do or has done. Okay, but am I, would I say that the state of Israel doesn't have a right to exist? No, of course I wouldn't. I mean, that's absurd. And would I say that I love Israel, but I don't always agree with what its government does? That's what I would say. I think you would find a lot of Iranians who would say they love Iran, but they can't stand their regime. And plenty of them are actually around in London at the moment. <laughs> so I think it's really important to disaggregate that. You cannot say you can't have a Jewish state unless you're prepared to say there can't be a Christian state, there can't be a Muslim state or whatever. The nature of the government and how they use that particular religious affiliation is obviously open to criticism. Right. A lot has been written about anti-Semitism in Britain. I mean, I'm thinking some major thinkers have weighed in, uh, like historians like Deborah Lipstadt and sociologists like David Hirsch, and of course the Chakrabarti report that was the first commissioned by the Labour Party to look into uh, the issue. When you decided to write this book, what, what did you feel was missing from the debate? I wanted to write an easy book. I wanted to write an easy read, something that you could almost pick up as if it were a novel, which got, got dealt with the history and then said what the key issues are. And I don't know whether I've succeeded, but it is quite a short book and it does get quite a lot of history and quite a lot of dis distinctions into it. The problem about Deborah Lipstadt or, you know, David Hirsch or any of those others is that it's too complicated. Most people can't understand it. Well, If people come up to me all the time, not so much now because it's been in the news so much, but, you know, last year, I mean, we're not talking long ago, and say, is there really anti-Semitism in the Labour Party? You know, what is that? That's what got me to write the book because they kept on saying, well, I can't believe it. I don't understand it. And I would say, rightly, but I grew up in the Labour Party and I assure you there was none of it then. And, you know, but there is anti-Semitism in the Labour Party now and there's anti-Semitism on the far right. It's not only on the far left. And yes, it does really exist. And this is a bit of what it is. And then you'd start explaining. And then I think, you know what? I think I'm going to write it down because everybody's asking me this all the time. Do you think that uh, the um, problem of anti-Semitism in public life in Britain, as you say, it's not just the Labour Party, is perhaps an extension or a reflection of broader woes of the British society? I'm talking about Brexit, of course. Uh, the of fact course. that you know the, the, that the country is so divided... And uh, I mean, also, if you take a more perhaps a Marxist approach and say after a decade of austerity that has ravaged the country, this is perhaps the, the cultural manifestation of the, of the backlash. Do, do you buy in, into any of that? Little bits. So I certainly think that xenophobia increased dramatically after the Brexit vote. I don't think anybody would dispute that. They may come from different bits of the political spectrum, but I don't think anybody's really disputing that because, I mean, the incidence was quite clear. And, you know, if you if you talk to polls, I mean, they had an absolutely terrible time in the immediate aftermath of the Brexit vote. So clearly we are a much more divided society than we were. And, you know, as we're recording this at the moment, we're a few days before a general election in Britain. And it's quite possible, I don't know, but it's quite possible we'll get a hung parliament again because, yet again, we're divided and there's no absolutely clear majority. So, of course, there has been something since the Brexit vote. 52 to 48 is quite a narrow majority. I mean, I know Israel has its political problems too. Um, but, you know, it's a narrow majority. It's very difficult to say what does the country really feel. So, xenophobia increased. There's no doubt about that. But do I think anti-Semitism is only an expression of xenophobia? No, I don't. And do I think that, taking the Marxist view, that, you know, a decade of austerity uh, leads to wanting to say that you know, we have to change, therefore we have to go for the hard left? 
therefore it's okay to blame the Jews. No, I certainly don't. Actually, I don't think it's Marxist to blame the Jews. I have to say, I think it's Stalinist. And I think one of the things that really has horrified me is that some of what we have seen on the hard left of the Labour Party has echoes of the Stalinist, particularly the doctor's plot of the late 1940s and early 1950s. And it's some of the same kind of language. And they can't hear themselves. They really can't hear themselves. So they feel they've dealt with it. They feel that they've uh, understood it and dealt with it. But they haven't. because the. And I think it's important that the doctor's plot was itself, although the authors of that would not have accepted it, was coloured by the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, which goes right back to the beginning of the very beginning of the 20th century, was proven to be a forgery, published in the Times of London in 1921, and yet you can see it freely on social media at any time of the day or night. Now, that thinking that the Jews have some kind of world conspiracy, they want to control the world, they're going to push down on the backs of the poor, and that, you know, they talk to each other and they've got a plan. That, of course, filtered through. That thinking, even though clearly a forgery, filtered through into the doctor's plot, having been a big deal in the Nazi period, filters through into the doctor's plot, led to those doctors and others, mostly but not all Jewish, being fired, led ultimately to, in 1953 after Stalin's death, um, it being described as nonsense, yet again, a bit like the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. But you can say something is nonsense as many times as you like, but if it's repeated often enough, as happens on social media, people begin to believe it. And one of the things that I think is so scary... And that's why I say the Stalinist influence is so important, is I think it was repeated and constantly repeated and Jews were perceived as being an international conspiracy, not properly British, because I'm writing about what goes on in the UK, not properly British, and rich and powerful with a plot. Well, there are plenty of Jews who are quite wealthy, in fact, very wealthy indeed, but actually and I speak as a congregational rabbi, there are also plenty of Jews who aren't wealthy at all and, in fact, are below the poverty line. So the idea that this is, you know, a universal picture is absurd. But it is Stalinist thinking coming out here. So, so as, as you said, we are a few days before the, the election, so, you know, who knows what will happen? Who knows? Yeah, there could be a, a um, conservative landslide, there could be a hung parliament. Also, it's not very likely, but there could, could be a, be a Labour minor, go- minority it, government. And it could be a minority government. It could be a minority government with Labour in the lead, supported by the Scottish nationalists. I mean, anything is possible. So it could be yeah. that Jeremy Corbyn, who... Whether he is personally an anti-Semite or not, has presided over this rise in anti-Semitism within his own ranks, he could end up being prime minister. Yeah, so, and, and some people have dubbed that prospect an existential threat to British Jews. Do you uh, share that sentiment? No, I don't. I think that's over, I think that's extreme. I think it's over-egging it. Do I think he has behaved disgracefully? Absolutely, I do. Do I think that he has lied about investigating the cases of anti-Semitism in the Labour Party? Absolutely, he has. Do I think the chief rabbi was right to come out 10 days ago uh, accusing him of not being fit to be prime minister and of being of lying about all this, lying about the cases of anti-Semitism? Absolutely right. Is it an existential threat? No, I don't think it's an existential threat. It's not something I look forward to with any equanimity. I really don't want to see a Corbyn-led Labour Party in power in Britain, but it's not an existential threat. We'll deal with it. Yeah, because Britain has been, as you said earlier, very auspicious to its Jews. Um, And you are a case in point. You've filled many very prominent positions in British public life and many other Jews in, in, in Britain as well. Um, do you think that there's a you know a break here? Is it over for younger uh, British Jews? I, uh, will they face more difficulties than Jews faced before? Is the genie out of the bottle? Is my question, I don't think the genie is out of the bottle. I mean, I think there's so. <laughs> As often happens in the Jewish community, you won't be surprised to hear, some of the reaction has been a little extreme. And I don't think the genie's out of the bottle. I don't think that it will be difficult for younger Jews to get jobs. I don't, you know, we've all done... It's been a country where Jews have flourished. It's undoubtedly a country where Jews have flourished. Do I think that 
younger Jews will face more instances of anti-Semitism in whatever role they fulfil? Yes, I do. And I think they will particularly find that if their colleagues are largely on the left in, you know, in, in political terms. And I think that that's something that I find very worrying. In, in a way that might curtail them or jeopardise them? I don't or, think it no. jeopardises them. I think it just makes it more unpleasant. Mm-hmm. I think it makes them feel, you know, actually... I'm not so sure that I want to deal with these people. So it's easy enough for somebody of my generation. I'm quite old. I'm going to be 70 next birthday. You know, if somebody, I mean, they don't actually, but if somebody did say something to me, I'd probably just say, you know, who do you think you are? And shut up. I'm not going to use the expletive that I might use, but, you know, shut up. I think if you're a younger person, you're a social worker, you're a teacher, you're a nurse, you're whatever, and you get it, I think that's harder. Now, I do think that actually the right thing for us to do is confront it when we find it. But I think that's harder when you're younger and you're more reliant on your job and you're not quite sure how your bosses will react if you take a kind of quite extreme oppositional stance. So I think it's harder. I do think you'll get more of that because we are seeing more of it on the left. And I think, I mean, people have talked about this a lot, but social media is a form of echo chamber. So if you say something often enough on social media and repeat it and repeat it, it becomes a sort of fake truth. It's one of the reasons I actually think fact-checking is so important. So I do think that it's harder if some of these ideas become more widespread in British society and particularly in some sections of British society. So yes, I think it, it's it's more of an issue. What about those Jews on the left who are greatly outnumbered within the Jewish community, who still take a radically different view from yours and many others in, in the community, um, either denying the fact that anti-Semitism in the left is even a problem or saying that it's not as grave and you know perhaps taking a similar Uh, uh, view to yours, but only more so saying that it's been greatly exaggerated. Do you think that they're, um, I mean, mean, do you think that they're only making things worse? Do do they exacerbate the problem? I think they make things worse. I think they make things things worse because I think they're being deliberately blind. And I think being deliberately blind, pretending something isn't happening, is at best very foolish and at worst mendacious. So I don't think that's okay. Do you have any dialogue with those people? Um, Very occasionally, but on the whole, you know, they're not likely to have a dialogue with me because I've been fairly upfront about what I think. And I'm the sort of person that they would have known. I mean, uh, my roots are are from the left originally. I mean, I was in the Labour Party. I know some of them. I was school with some of them. I just think they're wrong. And I think... I think they're not only wrong, if you like, in belief, but I think they're not looking at the evidence. I do find it difficult to deal with people who refuse to look at hard evidence. It seems to me, you know, if Jeremy Corbyn says we haven't had that number of complaints or we have dealt with them, and it's demonstrably untrue that they've had far more complaints and they haven't dealt with them. And that all came out in the newspapers last weekend, even though we all knew it before, but it all came out absolutely in black and white. If you do that, you're just not looking at the evidence. It's just untrue. Similarly, a Jew who is on the left and who doesn't want it to be true. I think that's the problem. You don't want it to be true. It can't be true. It's me you're talking about. It can't be true. I think if they're not looking at the number of complaints and they're not looking at the kind of language that is used on social media and they're saying it's just not true, it may not be Corbyn himself who's doing it, but it's being done in Corbyn's name. And if they're not prepared to accept that's the case, I'm sorry, they're just not looking at the evidence and that's not okay. I'm asking about dialogue because I think that the only way out is really to win hearts and minds. Absolutely. And, and convince these people. And I'm asking you whether you've had any sort of dialogue with them because, you know, this is really the first step forward, I would think. With them? I actually don't think they're big enough to be significant, really. I mean, they're used, if you like, by Corbyn supporters because, you know, there are the Jews, you know, who who support us. Well, fine, but you're just a tiny minority. The the issue is to win hearts and minds of people who aren't Jewish but don't like anti-Semitism and don't like racism. And as a result of the chief rabbi's intervention, you know, 10 days ago or so, and I did a huge amount of, if you like, the mopping up comment, as it were. So I did a lot of the main news channels that day. Huge numbers of people came up to me in the street and they just said things like, you know, I really don't like it. I hadn't realized it was like that. 
I really don't like that. I feel very uncomfortable. I can't support him. Yeah. And, and, and that's the, those are the hearts and, and minds we exactly. need to, we and it's need not to just, support. And it's not just that this anecdotal evidence, even poll numbers show that he's the most unpopular leader yeah. of the opposition in, yeah. in modern although, British history. Although, of course, his, his polling levels have gone up uh, in, in these last few days, which does worry me. But it does seem as if the anti-Semitism stuff, you know, a lot of people just don't like it. They don't particularly love Jews. They just don't like it. They think it's racist. And they find, you know, Corbyn saying, I've always been opposed to anti-Semitism and racism. They just find that disingenuous. So it seems to me that you're uh, pretty sober about this, that uh, it's... Yeah. (laughs) No, that you think that uh, this um, terrible problem could be rolled back and pretty soon. I think that the extremeness of it at the moment could certainly be rolled back. That is to say, if Corbyn is not the leader of the Labour Party, if the Labour Party goes for somebody still maybe on the the, the, the left, but not an anti-Semite, and not, not back with, with advisors who aren't anti-Semites, um, and they deal with the anti-Semitism, that's an absolute requirement. They have to deal with the anti-Semitism in the party in a serious way. But it won't get better quickly because these attitudes and these attacks and this sort of false fake news stuff is around in the ether and it takes a really long time to deal with that. So although I think some of the very high profile stuff could go quite quickly, I think taking all that stuff down from social media getting rid of the echo chamber of those sorts of ideas, convincing the people who've been batting it backwards and forwards for years that this is complete, utter garbage and they ought to know better. In an era of fake news, when it's all a matter of opinion, I think that will take a very long time. So I don't think the battle is over if Jeremy Corbyn doesn't win the election. I just think that it will be easier to deal with some of the rest of it if he doesn't win the election. Right. So what needs to be done then? Just be persistent. Okay. So, so first of all, we just need to be persistent and we need to kind of raise it every time it occurs and we need to complain every time it occurs. And Labour is being investigated. The Labour Party is being investigated by the Equality and Human Rights Commission. This is unheard of. The only other British political party that's ever been investigated is the BNP, the British National Party, the far right. It's an absolute disgrace. And just being investigated, let alone what they find, is an absolute disgrace. So I think it takes quite a lot of time. I suspect, and this is a much bigger issue, that we're going to have to make the people who own the social media platforms take some responsibility for the content. And they're going to have to police it. And I think that people are no longer going to be able to, I mean, I don't know how long all of this will take, but at some point, you're no longer going to be able to be anonymous on Twitter, uh, and partic- well, particularly Twitter, but also Facebook. So that, you know, the absolutely vitriolic abuse that we see it can be traced back to you and you can be prosecuted for it. And as you should be, because I think hate speech is something you should be prosecuted for. So do I think there are things that can happen? Yes, but I think it'll take a very long time. The other thing I think is that if it becomes clear this is just completely unacceptable, socially unacceptable, it's remarkably quick for a social fashion to catch on. You know, none of us anymore use a plastic coffee cup. We were all bringing our own. Uh, We're very, very ambivalent about these plastic bottles of water. We use a water bottle now. Um, Those fashions change. Now, it's completely different stuff. But if it became totally unacceptable to put anti-Semitic stuff up on social media... In just the same way as your water would be in your own water bottle, you wouldn't be putting uh, anti-Semitic stuff up on social media. And I think it's that. You have to make it unacceptable. And that requires a much younger generation of Jews, but not only Jews. We've had huge support from other communities of people saying, you can't do that. Stop it. Take it down. Not okay. Yeah. All right. uh, Rabbi Baroness Julia Neuberger, thank you very much for coming on the show. Thank you very much. 
And also a big thanks to Gizem Ozdemir, our sound engineer, and to Itai Shalem and Georgia Foscarini, our producers, as well as the Van Leer Institute for the generous support. And now we've got a request. Many or most of you listen to us on the Apple Podcasts app, and we would like to ask you to please consider writing us a review. Also, you can support us by going to our website, that's tlv1.fm slash review, and subscribing onto our Patreon campaign. Every little helps. Check out our archive. It has more than 500 interviews to keep you busy, entertained, and hopefully annoyed as well. If you like what we do here, please like us on Facebook. Our page is called the Tel Aviv Review Podcast Ideas from Israel. And follow me and Dalia on Twitter. Join us again next week for another edition of the Tel Aviv Review. And until then, goodbye. <laughs>